Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy podcast. Each week, we expose the faulty foundational mindsets of the past and rebuild a newer, stronger foundation essential in creating your meaningful legacy. We've got a lot of work to do, so let's get started. As much as you like this podcast, I'm certain that you're going to love the book that I just released on Amazon, Fuel Your Legacy, The Nine Pillars to Build a Meaningful Legacy. I wrote this to share with you the experiences that I had while I was identifying my identity, how I began to create my meaningful legacy and how you can create yours. You're going to find this book on Kindle, Amazon, and as always on my website, samnickerbacher.com. Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy show. And today we have another incredible guest on our, on our platform. Um, I've actually been friends with them on Facebook for a while. We've been kind of back and forth reviewing each other's content. And then the, I don't know, a week ago, two weeks ago, um, we both got in more contact and said, Hey, I think, I think I actually want to interview this guy on my podcast. Um, he has great content. He's, he's really on a mission to provide services, uh, for families that are very close to my heart. And which is one of the reasons why I'm having him on here. But also, you know, there's, there's a business side of somebody's life and then there's who the person is. And that's what I'm excited to learn. Like, how did he get there? Why did he get there this way? So his name is Jared Briggs. You can go, uh, if you stalk me long enough, then you'll see his comments on my stuff, but you can also just go look him up on either Facebook, Instagram, any one of those places, but he's just living the dad life, you know, business owner since he was 23 years old in a small town, grew up on a cattle ranch, used to play a lot of basketball. Now he plays a lot of golf. Um, just living the life, but more importantly is why he's living the life that he's living and how is he combining that with his family and really ultimately building the legacy that he's proud of and which is why I have him on the podcast today. So go ahead, Jared, give us a, the little rundown of you know, where you came from. How did you get to where you are? Why are you where you are? And then uh, we'll, we'll dive into it. Sweet. Well, I appreciate having me on here and give me a chance to visit with you and share these things. So like Sam said, my name is Jared Briggs, grew up in a really small town, like really small. My graduating class was 16 people. So like when I say small, it's small, right? Um, so come from a really small, uh, small community, agriculture. My mom and dad were just those type that worked their butts off and uh, always working. So from a young age, I don't know why, but I just always had this pull and uh, just this like hunger and thirst to figure out, you know, how to create success, how to create wealth, how to create financial abundance, how to accomplish big things. Because the, the biggest reason why is it was really hard for me to watch, you know, my parents, other family, friends, everybody around me um, struggle financially, like honestly, just struggle financially. So graduated high school and was always just interested in these things. Funny story is graduated high school and I was like, you know, I probably should start like reading personal development books. I should probably start learning because I had no clue what I wanted to do in high school. So one of the, the first books I bought was one of Donald Trump's books, which is just super hilarious now, right? With everything yeah. going on and stuff. So I'm like, that's funny. Um, I would say his books are really good by any means, but it got me really started on the personal development side of things. So graduated high school was just working, reading books thinking, man, I want to own my own business. I want to start my own business someday. And I ended up deciding to go on a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, went and did that. And while I was there, I spent a lot of time visiting with people. I lived in South Carolina for two years, served the people there. There's like a very diverse spectrum of people there. There's really wealthy people. And then there's like the projects, the very, I mean, government subsidized everything. And so it was really interesting being a part of those. And I would ask a lot of questions, you know, people that were successful, you know, middle class, were very successful, not successful, you know, what were they doing? Why were they doing it? How are they doing it? So it's kind of funny. I was there teaching about Christ, but at the same time, like I had some other things in the, in the back of my mind to just learn information and knowledge. So I came home from a mission and just started reading, studying, reading books, learning everything I could about money and, and finance. So the, the funny part of it is, is I came across the insurance industry and decided, I was like, you know, I could do that. You know, go get my health license, my life license and started helping people. So I married, I got married in 2016, 
And it was literally months later, started my insurance business, got my insurance license, started my business and started selling insurance. But one of the big things that I've spent a lot of time doing uh, as I help people with Medicare and health insurance and, and a bunch of things that I do, I've been able to see the spectrum of people, you know, in their twenties and thirties, what they do to in their careers, their in their jobs and their finances, all of those things. Cause I got to know all those information things to help them. But then I've also helped people in their sixties, seventies and eighties. And so that wide spectrum I've now visited, I've been doing it for six years. I mean, hundreds of people, I wouldn't be surprised if it's now been thousands of conversations uh, about money, about insurance, about retirement, about investing, about all, just all aspects of money. And that's been the real fun and interesting part about it is, you know, some people, the success and wealth that they created with just the simplest things. And then some of the big businesses and different things other people did. And then the people that didn't do much and now what they're doing and how they're doing it. So I've just been taking a lot of this information and data, putting it together and just using it for knowledge and information, just to understand what truth is. So I spent a lot of time reading books. I spent a lot of time studying, you know, financial industry markets, insurance, just all aspects and spectrums of them. Um, so that's kind of a, an overview of my business type life, my professional life. But like you said, golf, I've been really getting into golf lately. I actually this morning went and did some chipping and putting and hitting at the range. I'm going to go golfing with a friend tomorrow and just been really working on getting better at that game. Cause there's so much you can learn from it. Um, my wife and I built a house just recently. Uh, we moved into the house in March and my wife's got a really good job. We got a young daughter. So like we're, we're right in the thick of it of, you know, I'm still 29, still in our twenties. Both my wife and I are both still in our twenties. So we're right in the thick of it of like, what is truth? What is not truth? How do we obtain, you know, financial abundance and how do we create success for us and, uh, learning every day, each and every day. Awesome. Well, Hey, thank you. Uh, I'm going to dig into here. So that yeah. some elements of your story are very similar to mine. And then, you know, elements are, are way different. So I'm excited to learn about that. So small town, Wyoming, um, 16 people, how many people were in your entire high school? So it's actually small town, Utah. Oh, Utah. So, I mean, we could huck a rock and hit Wyoming, but yeah, it was in Utah. So it was out by the flaming gorge, a small town called Manila, Utah. So in my high school from like seventh grade to 12th grade, I don't even think there was a hundred students when I, there is now it's grown a little bit, but I don't even think there was a hundred students from junior high to high school. So do they have sports there or what do they do? Oh yeah. We got baseball, basketball, volleyball, track, golf, FFA, FBLA, like, uh, yeah. Did everybody but, do everything? Yeah. So I got to play baseball, basketball, track and field. FFA, like I, yeah, I was a part of all of it. That's so fascinating. Cause if there's barely enough people to like form a team. See, and that's, I mean, it's such a culture thing that, I mean, I can't, what do we have? My senior year, there was like 30, 40 kids on our team, on our basketball team. Like it was great. Cause everybody played, like it's, it's, it's a very big culture thing. Like, and even a small town like ours, I mean, we've won multiple state champions in basketball. The girls have placed really high. Uh, we've had track state champions, multiple golf state champions. Like even though, I mean, it's 1A, so it's within the 1A system, but even with that amount of kids, like sports are still massively competitive. With, uh, with 1A, is that, do they have like the seven man football teams? There are some that do. We didn't have football at all. I but there are, there, yeah, there are some that do. Yeah. We, there was a little town next to where I grew up in Parma, Idaho, and there's a called notice. That's the name of the town. And <laughs> there maybe it was 500 people in the whole town. Like yeah. maybe, if you were lucky and I, they had a school there and they just played seven man football, but they didn't have yeah. any other sports that I know of. Oh, really? But it's like in the one, a system, like how many other one, a schools are there? like 20, 30. So did you yeah, drive all over the country, all over the. Yeah. So, I mean, we, no, like, yeah, we have our different regions. So there's like the Southern regions. There's like one or two regions down there, kind of the middle of the state and then the Northern regions. So we'd go up to like Ridge County, um, 
Altamont, Duchesne, Tabiona over by Vernal, Utah area. And uh-huh. uh, they, they were in our region, but then like down Southern Utah, like Escalante, Wayne, Penguich, Paiute, all those schools, like those are all 1A schools. Wow. So a lot of small town, like farming community type farming ranching type community that's that's our region it's a lot of driving I'm, oh have, yeah. yeah it's i, I mean like, you have to take two spent, days off school almost just to yeah like we would leave school i don't know 11 one o'clock drive to our game get there by the evening and then we wouldn't get home till one two in the morning most nights so a lot of bus drives it was so fun though, man. Like I know, those, they're good the memories, bus driving but... memories, like, oh yeah, it was super fun. Yeah. What's crazy is you, we were about the same time. So it was right when like iPods, all that oh, stuff yeah. was just coming out. Now you have basically everything on your phone I know. and it's so much more powerful. But before it's like, you can have so many songs on your iPad and your iPod shuffle. Or if you're like, yeah. <laughs> dude, I remember that's the funny thing is like, what year did you graduate high school? I graduated 2012. 2010. Okay. So same, pretty similar. You know, yeah. everybody's like, you grew up with an iPhone. And I'm like, actually the iPhone was like coming out when I was. Yeah. The few rich, rich, rich kids had them. But yeah. Like, everybody Other than that, had them. nobody had an iPhone, you know? Yeah. And the iPhone, it was like those old egg shaped ones. It was, and it was thick, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thick, heavy. You were, and you were still thrilled with like 3G. Now, if you have yeah. 3G, you're like, why is this taking so long to this load? This is awful. Yeah, I remember. So I had a flip phone, just, you know, just call yeah. text. That's all you could do. But then I remember I my had. junior, senior year, I got a, an iPod Touch. And that's where I'd play games and music and stuff on the, on the bus, you know. And dude, I, I thought I was the crap with an iPod Touch, you know. Like that was, that was wild. Yeah, that's so, so, so silly. Isn't uh, that funny? <laughs> yeah. Time, time warp, man. The oh, kids who will never know. And then there's stuff that we don't even know about compared yeah. to what our parents had. But yeah, no the 16 people, the competitiveness of inside of that group, I'm the seventh of 11 kids. And we were homeschooled. So I kind of grew up next to a school in Parmido. So I got to spend a lot of time doing all the sports, but I didn't go to school with them. Um, so that, that was an interesting dynamic. But when, when you say your mom and dad worked hard, what, what were they doing for work? What was their hard work? What did it look like? Um, so for the longest time, my mom managed a restaurant up in the mountains called Ren Canyon Lodge. And she was like the manager of the restaurant. I mean, she pretty much ran the place. She actually made pretty good money doing that, but she was never home. So I want to say I was in junior high when she quit that. And she actually started becoming, she went and got her uh, CDL license and she started driving bus. And so, which was super cool because all my sports, FFA, everything that I did, I mean, I was always on a trip somewhere for school. She drove a ton of them. And so it was super fun because she got paid to watch me play sports and travel around with me, you know? So that was super cool. So my mom did that. And then in the summer, she'd just do whatever she could to, you know, make money or whatever. And then my dad, I mean, he had so many jobs. I can't even count oil filled stuff, truck driving stuff, stuff like own business type stuff once in a while. Didn't work quite a, quite a bit. So it was just kind of a hard aspect, but we also had our cattle ranch where we had, you know, 80 cows, 150 cows sometimes. And then my brother and I, we both had, I think I got up to 12, 15 cows. My brother had about that. So we were running that at the same time. Plus we did 4-H and we traveled a ton for 4-H in the summers and, and stuff right. like that, showing our steers and stuff like that. So yeah, for, for work, I mean, it was just whatever was available. And So when was the first time that you, cause you mentioned, you know, it was hard to watch other people struggle financially, family members and other people that maybe you knew in the community. When was the first time you can remember like, was there a specific experience that you're like, this is just not how it's supposed to be. There's gotta be something better. What was that experience that led to that thought? There's gotta be. Something I would, better. I would say before 10, it's funny. You actually mentioned that I've been doing a lot of mindset training, like going back into those stories and reprogramming all that stuff for sure. me. Um, so I want to say it was like seven to 10 years old. I remember an experience where my mom and dad were, arguing about money, struggling with money. Right. And 
I remember I, I always was interested in paying bills and managing money and, and stuff like that. So I was this little kid, I'd go get a notebook and I would act like I was doing bills. You know, I'd act like I was writing stuff down, but I didn't have anything to flip and do, you know, but I was just like, man, this is cool. Like I want to do this stuff. Right. And I just, I remember watching them stress and struggle and fight about money and, you know, just struggle to make ends meet. I mean, it was paycheck to paycheck all the time. And there's, there's a lot of reasons why. Right. And so, so that's, that's the biggest thing, but like in my dad's family, nobody has money. Like I make way more than <laughs> anyone it, that of them ever have in their life. And my mom's family, there are some that make a little bit more, like they do pretty well for themselves, but nothing crazy, you know, N nothing crazy at all. And so, you know, like my dad's side of the family, I still, to this day, I don't think I've sat in a restaurant with all of them because nobody could afford to go to a restaurant. They, they couldn't afford to go do it. I mean, they would with their families once in a while, but as a big group or something, you know, we just get together and everybody pitch in and have a meal and, you know, stuff like that. So just, I, I noticed it from a young age, like a very young age that, man, they're just, everybody around me struggles with money. Why? Like, why do they struggle with money? And so that's been the big answer that I've set out to understand and solve and learn and, and accomplish, right? So, yeah. So I just want to clarify the question here so we can hopefully get yeah, yeah. great context. So there's two questions here that could be asked. Um, and both are good questions. I don't think that either one is better or worse per se, but I wonder which one would have the most impact on somebody Yeah, and create the most change inside of them. So there's the question of, you know, why do other people struggle with money? which could take you down an entirely different studying path course and whatever versus how can I never struggle with money? You know, the, the power of those two questions, they seem very similar, but the outcome is going to be different. If you ask your brain, how can I not struggle with money? Then you're going to end up with a result of you figuring out ways to get money. If you ask yourself, well, why is somebody else struggling with money? Then you're going to be focused outward and you may not ever internalize that and actually create the actions to not have yourself be struggling as well. So I'm wondering, did, did you always ask it in the, in the sense of why is other people struggling with money? Or at what point did it switch and say, you know, how can I make sure that I don't struggle? Because that's- Yeah, so this is, this is the big thing that really caused me to think a lot. So they're out in Manila, just into Wyoming. There's a lot of mines, like phosphate mines. And so a lot of people work at those mines, a lot of men, you know, there's some women that work out there too. They're good jobs. Like these guys can be making 80, 90, 100, 120, $130,000 pretty fast. Like they make a good income for manual, you know, blue collar work. And it, there was a couple friends of mine, their dads worked there. Well, one, I remember two friends in specific, one of the friends, I could tell that his parents were really good with their money. Like they never went crazy and bought excess of things. They always seemed to be on top of things, you know, the management of it and just being good stewards of their money. Right. They had a nice house, nice vehicles, but it wasn't wild, but they always had what they needed. And I, and I never like their kids never were told no, or, you know, like they were just really good with their money. But then on the other spectrum, there's another friend, you know, his dad worked the same place. Maybe, maybe one was a manager, maybe one was, that. I don't know, maybe they had a difference in income, but still they were both making good money. Right. And I mean, they were paycheck to paycheck and you could tell they struggled a little bit more just from conversations and things I'd hear from my friends and stuff. And I was just like, why? Like, how can that, how can that be? Right. That's the big question I wanted to understand is you have people that make lots of money and then you have people that don't make lots of money yet. There's people that make lots of money, paycheck to paycheck. There's people that don't make lots of money. They're not paycheck to paycheck. So it's like, that was what was the big thing that I wanted to understand is what, like, what is money? How does money work? How can we be a good steward of money? How can we manage money? Like, what is this thing and how can we get really good at it? Then from there, I mean, I honestly believe anybody can create and generate income. Like you go, you go learn a skill 
and you get good at that skill, you become one of the best at that skills at that skill, you will make money. I mean, I meet people all the time now and I'm like, you make how much doing what the Mm -hmm. stupidest things. And they're making multiple six figures. You know, it's just like, well, they got really good at it. You know, that's like people hate professional athletes and I get the politics and crap about it. Forget all that. But think, you know, think NBA, right? I said, I like, I like basketball. Think NBA. They are the best in the world. So they make, they make lots of money. Right. So, so that was the thing I was like, okay, I can go learn the skills. I can develop the things to create the income. But the biggest secret I found is it's not how much you make, it's what you do with it. And, and so that's like from watching this as from my childhood, seeing these different families, seeing my family, everybody around me, I'm like, Hey, it's, it's not a hundred percent how much you make. It's what you do with it is the deciding factor to what your wealth and your financial abundance looks like. Sure. So I'm going to ask a a question here and it's coming from a personal perspective. So this is, I think it's funny. Um, but it's also like funny cry type funny (laughs) because it's my real life, you know? So I don't know how long ago, maybe five, 10 years ago when I first started in my career, I lived on $4,000 a month and we made it work right. As my income has increased, yes, I've saved a lot more. So now like when I was making $4,000 a month, I was hardly saving any, maybe like 200 bucks a month. I was just wasn't saving very much. As I've increased my income, my percentage of savings has you know, gone up to where it's 20, 30% now. So it's not that I'm not saving money, but the other aspect of that saving is other areas of my life have gotten more expensive. And that happens. Um, you, you start off renting somewhere for 900 bucks a month, and then you have a few kids and now you're, you have a mortgage. And you know, sometimes, prices do increase. Sometimes inflation actually impacts you. Oh, yeah. um, sometimes our behavior impacts us. So I'm curious if you had a similar experience to me. I don't know if you have or not. Uh, and if you didn't, I'm curious how you managed it otherwise. So I've, um, in the last year, for whatever reason, and I, I just, this came up to me because I was talking to some family members about what they, how much they spend on groceries every month. and. So they, and I, the funny thing is like, I go through this with clients all the time. So it's like, I should know, but it just has never clicked in my head this way. But I was like, how much do you spend on groceries? And they're like, oh, maybe $600 a month. And I was like, you've got a, four kids. How do you only spend $600 a month? So I was like, what are you buying? Like, what are you buying? They go through their list of what they buy. I'm like, okay, maybe. So then I start asking other people, like, how much is your grocery bill for five adults and three kids? How much is your grocery bill? Oh, maybe 900. And it's so expensive. We spend so much money on food. I'm like, <laughs> this is the embarrassing thing. Um, our average budget, so it's my wife and two, a, a six-year-old, a four-year-old, and a baby. Okay. Our, our monthly grocery bill is about $2,100 a month. Holy moly. <laughs> That's why I'm like, wait a second, where did we start spending so much money? So I'm like going through, what are we spending our money on? <laughs> Cause it just like, it creeps up. We eat healthy, but I know other people who are eating healthy, who are spending a fraction of what I'm spending. So I'm like, okay, it's not just healthy. What, what's the thing that is the thing that's over the top or like uncommon for other people? Like what, is, what are we doing? That's uncommon in other people. I think I know at least where $600 extra is going, which is fine. I'm not, I'm not against it. You could categorize it however you want. We get to meal plans that uh, helped both my wife and I, we, we lost weight and that was eight, it's $800 a month just for the meal plan. So like, sure. I understand where that cost is. That's a, an easy cost, but still, even if you wipe that cost out, somebody has got to pay for, um, like if, if either one of us stopped eating those, then we'd have to eat other food. So we're not going to save yeah. $800. If we cut that out, we'd probably save 400 to $600. If we cut out those meal plants and ate stuff from the grocery store. So that's one thing. The other thing is, um, I don't always separate out in my budgeting and this, everybody does it different perishable versus non-perishable, right? So like our diapers and wipes and, paper plates, paper forks, all that goes into my grocery bill. So that's probably another hundred, $200 a month that goes in there. That's 
included in that. Uh, yeah. and so it, the, part of the reason I bring this up is it all depends on how you segment your budget, right? So that's part of it. Then the other part of it is we're kind of lazy ish, my wife and I, and so, and we have the means to do it. So there's two sides of this, right? Sometimes you can buy convenience. So we buy uh, baby food pouches for our, our daughter because it's simpler than making them. Thank you. Um, and so, so, <laughs> so it's like, there, there's these things and it's like, okay, let's say we don't buy that. And th this is a type of money mindset that I think I, I want your perspective on as far as seeing these two, because you did a great job at illustrating those two different families. Yeah. Uh, and and you, you're in the industry. Sometimes when you lower the cost in one area, maybe their mental health goes down. So then you have more hospital bills. You have more other things that cost money because, and that's a balancing act. It's not like, a, oh, well, we should cut this out, cut this out and, you know, be robots. So uh, I'm curious um, if in your experience, as you've increased your income, what things in your life have you seen gradually go up without really thinking about it before you're like, man, we got to, we got to knock this down. This is, we, we got a little too lax in our process. We didn't stop saving money. We we're still increasing our savings, but we also increased other things that don't really need to be increased. So I'm curious if that happened to you. And if so, you know, what, what was your response and how did you discover it? That's a man, that's a super good question. And every family in America has experienced this. Every, I mean, when my wife and I first got married, I wasn't even making a thousand bucks a month. We were literally living on 800 a month, my wife and I. And then as income grew, life changed, right? Can I share my perspective of like how we manage all of that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll share that perspective and we can have a conversation back and yeah. forth about this. One thing that I realized really quick from all the finance books that I've read, the courses that I've gone through, the conversations that I've had, all of those things is it's very hard to cut expenses because our mind can focus on one thing at a time. We can either focus on abundance, which is income generating activities, or we can focus on scarcity, which is decrease in expenses activities. Now I got to be careful there because some people are like, oh, it doesn't matter what I spend money on. No, you, you got to be smart, right? Like right. these apps that people are using that shows them what their subscriptions are. I'm like, if you don't know what you're signed up for, that's the first problem. Like you should not need an app to tell you where you're spending your money. You should know, oh yeah, we have a Netflix account. We have it, you know? So, so that's the first thing. So, so I share and I, and I, my wife and I, finally learned that we're like, we can either focus on increasing income or we can focus on cutting expenses. Okay. So that was, that was the first concept of it. Then I learned really quickly. I'm like, from, from a, a very good book that I've read, I don't even know how many times I just finished it again. Cause it just gets them financial juices flowing again is the concept of pay yourself first. So I actually, I don't know what we spend on groceries. I, I have no clue. Like I don't track it. I don't look at it because my whole concept is my minimum I'm going to save every month is 10%. I know I can generate wealth. If I take the, the best wealth generating tool I have, which is my income, if I can be disciplined within that and I save a minimum of 10% every month, I know my wealth will grow every month. Now I challenge myself. Can we get to 25%? Can we get to like, let's save as much as we can. Right? So when my wife gets paid, when I get paid, I, first people I pay is ourselves. I put money, I have specific labeled accounts. This is for retirement. This is for investing. This is for this. This is for my wife's spending. Da, 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 da. Like I have specific buckets of money that that money is for those things only. After that, my wife and I are like, cool. You want a new car? Sweet. Let's go buy a new car. Let's, oh, like this last weekend, we went, stayed at a hotel. We went to the aquarium. We went to the zoo. We went and ate some good food. We had a blast with our daughter because we were like, let's not do get a ton of gifts for Christmas. Let's go do experiences. So this was something that we had planned, right? So my whole thing is if I pay myself first, I mean, we're working and, and most people, this is the biggest problem. Most people take their money and pay everybody else first and try to save last. It'll never work ever, ever. It'll never work. That's why 99% of America is broke, right? Mm -hmm. So from our perspective, yeah, inflation's gone crazy, right? 
I mean, we buy like three, four gallons of milk a week. Yeah. They're way more than they were two years ago. Right. So all of those things, you know, people focus so much on the cost of it. And I'm just like, Hey, as long as we execute, I created a whole system that I use that tells me, you know, I, I plug the money in. It tells me where to put it. I do it done. Um, so I just execute that plan. The whole focus is paying ourselves first, making sure those things are taken care of. Then it's like, Hey, you know, we want to go out to eat or we want to buy this or, Hey, I've been wanting to, you know, like I've been, I wanted to watch the NBA finals and playoffs. So I was like, Hey, I'm going to get a sling subscription and, and watch those games. Cool. When it's over, I'll cancel it. And, you know, but it didn't, it didn't affect our budget. It didn't affect our savings. It didn't affect our wealth growing because we do that first instead of at the end. So yeah. So, yeah. so that's my perspective of it, right? No, I, I think it's great. And I, I agree with you. And that's why the, some of those other expenses, they creep up and you don't think to, I mean, I, I track all my money. I'm sure you track your money. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Do you know it? And are you analyzing it all the time? And if somebody came in and this is what happened because something happened where it was like, Hey, we might need to cover somebody's bills for a few months. Yeah, and I'm, yeah. I'm like, Hey, I'd love to help. How much are we looking at? You know? And they're like, Oh, well, you know, things might go up to like a thousand dollars because they're going to be eating extra healthy. And I was like, wait a second, what do you mean go up to a thousand dollars? That's, that's what jogged my thought. Cause I was like, wait a second, what do you mean going up to a thousand dollars? How do you like, how much are you spending? You know? So that, that's what jogged the question. Cause like, for me, it doesn't matter. It's just like, it's part of my life and I don't mind it. And I've, I've actually had this conversation with my father-in-law probably mm, four or five months ago. I don't know, maybe longer. Uh, but it's like, there's a point where you're able, you have the, the funds to focus on different things and focusing on those things is okay. You know, yeah. and, and some people, they don't have the funds to focus on those. And so that's not something that when you have, and, uh, there's another guy, Ramit, uh, uh, what's his last name? Anyways, has a show on Netflix, how to get rich or something like that. Great show. But something he talks about in there is money dials and how, like what you like to spend your money on and what you'd rather not spend money on. Yeah. yeah. See, Everybody that's... has a different thing that they're willing to allow themselves to splurge on. And then other things are like, nah, you won't catch me dead spending money on clothes, but I want this new gadget for my office. Absolutely. I'll spend $200. And you don't even think about the $200 purchase, even though the clothes was $20 and you're like, Oh, you know, it hurts to spend $20. But then like, without even thinking about it, you spend 200 over here. And it's all because the value that we place on things has nothing to do with the dollar cost of it. And exactly. analyzing your psychology is super crucial. So uh, anyways, say what you're going to say, and then I'll ask the question. Okay. So you nailed it on the head. Like what's important to you, right? So when my wife and I first got married, like it's been non-negotiable for me that I'm going to create success. I want to create financial abundance because I watched my family paycheck to paycheck their whole freaking life. They still are that today. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. I'm going to, I'm going to learn the game early. And so my wife and I like, man, I like, I like to hunt this year's the first year I got a tag in 11, 12 years because I didn't want to spend the money on the hunt. I didn't want to spend the money, go to the hunt. I didn't want to spend money on the clothes that I got to buy. Da, 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 da. I was like, Nope, that's an expense that I could use towards my business or growing our wealth or, you know, something like that. And so we've like, that's been important to us is sacrificing some of those other things. You know, we've never had TV services or big extravagant things, or, you know, like we, we just didn't splurge on those things in our twenties. Cause we were like, we'd rather take that money and invest it, grow it, save it and be purposeful with that money. Right. Cause we're like, man, if we can figure, we can figure it out early and really start that compounding by the time we're 30, 40, 50, we'll be doing things that people would only dream of. Like that's our goal, right? And it happens a lot quicker than it happened a lot. Like my wife and I, our house that we just built, when we bought the house plans, like we use savings money to buy those house plans. We were like, we have no flipping clue how we're going to build this house, like, and how we're going to afford it. We did it. Now we're making the payment. We're like, man, we grew into it. Like, we were so focused and disciplined on that. One of the things that I said is my wife has a spend account. I have a spend account. We get a specific dollar amount in there every month. So if my wife's like, Hey, I want to go do this, you know, and if it's 60 bucks and she only has 50, she's like, yeah, I guess I'll have to wait till next month until I get more money. Now, a lot of people look at like, Oh, that's controlling and that sucks and stuff, you know, 
multiple times I've asked my wife, I said, Hey, do you want to increase that? Like, I do not want to hold you back. Do you want to increase that so you can enjoy more? Or do you want to continue taking that extra throwing into our investment account and growing those things? And she'd be like, let's keep investing. We can enjoy later. Right? So like, we've been very disciplined with that, but at the same time, like we are working hard. So if you're not enjoying your money, like you're going to burn out really quick. And I figured that out. So I want to share this next aspect of it. I never enjoyed money. I never bought anything. I never did anything. And I got three, four years in my business and I burnt out because I'm like, what am I working for if I'm never enjoying it? Like this, this sucks. Like I, I burnt yeah. out quick. Right. And so like now we've implemented into our plan vacation and gift fund. Like, so we put a specific amount of money in there every month. My wife and I are going to go on a great little uh, anniversary trip this year. You know, I've, I just bought a bow cause I, you know, did a deer hunt. So I'm like, okay, we still execute the plan. That is the most important thing. We're still putting our specific percent that we're shooting for into savings, investments, all of those things. After that, let's enjoy, let's have fun. Let's experience, let's do things because a couple of years ago, I've wanted a dirt bike for years. And I thought about it and thought about it and thought about it and thought about it. I had the cash, pay cash, bought a brand new 2021 dirt bike. And I was freaking thinking about it for finally one day, my wife's like, she turned around in the bedroom. She's like, go buy the dirt bike. So you'll shut up and stop talking about the dirt bike. And I'm like, done. I'm going to go do it. I didn't need her permission, but I was like looking for it. Right. I bought the dirt bike. It motivated me to increase and do more because it was fun and enjoyable. My business grew because of it. So there's an aspect like you need to be very disciplined with your money and have a specific plan, but you also need to enjoy it because that creates motivation and enjoyment. And like, that was fun. I want to do it again, right? Like I want to experience that again. So it, it, every part of my life has grown now that we enjoy things more, but I, I, I look back at it as like, man, I don't, I don't think I would have this much joy without the discipline and skills that we learned within money, how money works, what to do with it. And so that, that's like been a very key aspect for us is yeah. having that discipline, but enjoying it at the same time. Right. Yeah. And one, one of the things that just like we talk about financial freedom and independence and all these different terminologies and what they mean to different people. And I'm not necessarily to get into that, but I do believe this, it's the same thing with time freedom and, and financial freedom that if you, so it's actually like an old, like, I don't know if it's, it's just energy, natural law consequences, right? And any energy that is not being um, organized and created into organization is atrophying and turning into chaos. Like that's just, it either is being ordered or it's turning into chaos. Okay. It's the same thing with your money and same thing with your time. You're either yeah. um, being intentional and placing it or you it's turning into chaos. The difference, like what financial freedom or time freedom means to me now versus six months ago, because it just wasn't quick. Like I had made, I was making good money, still am making good money. But what that meant was, hey, I've got, I can do whatever I want now with, within reason, right? And so I'm not going crazy, but I can do whatever I want. And what I learned was, no, actually, it comes down to, are you being intentional with it? Financial freedom, time freedom is, do you, you're now in a position to control and direct it where there's people who are working paycheck to paycheck. They've gotten so under the gun that they're working just to pay for their responsibilities. They don't have any control over where that money goes. They don't know what's going on because their time is controlled by the fact that they've made these commitments that they have to fulfill on. And so it's like this cascading effect of they have no control of their money or their time. And time freedom isn't that you don't have commitments or obligations. Time freedom is that you are now in charge of where you're going to place your time. Same you're living life on your terms. Correct. Yeah. It's yep. not that there's no obligations or that you're, you just have an empty, clear schedule every day. No successful person I know has an empty, clear schedule every day. They're all very active and very intentional with their time, but they're in control of their time. So if they want to say no to something, they have the freedom financially and the, the time freedom to say, yeah, I don't want to do that. Or I do want to do that where somebody who has to show up to work so that they can make money so that they can keep their commitments. They don't have the freedom of time. They don't have the free. And if you get to a freedom of time and freedom of money, and then 
you become lax and you start neglecting that freedom, then you'll find yourself back in somebody will usurp your freedom and start controlling you. It's just it's a, it's a natural laws of the universe. It's not because somebody's good or bad. It's just the natural way of things. And so learning how to master that, I think, is an important skill. But first, asking your question, asking the question of, you know, why is this happening? And that's the first question you ask yourself. Why is this happening? And this can't happen to me. So I think yeah. that's, that's huge. I'm curious, um, what, um, obviously, you studied a ton about the financial industry. What ultimately got you into the insurance industry? Um, for, I mean, there's so many different areas of finance that somebody could end up in. Why did you choose that industry over any other industry? Man, it just, I knew somebody that was in the business and uh, I was working for a guy. Like I said, I, was, I wasn't even making a thousand bucks a month. I was helping him with his cattle and his saw, or his, uh, he owned a, a feed company and a couple of things. So I was going to school full time. I went to two semesters of school and quit that. Um, but I was just like, man, I'm never going to accomplish goals making a thousand bucks a month. Right. And so I just told my wife one day, I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to start looking for something different. And it just happened to be the, the guy that I ended up joining with, he, his wife ran into my wife on campus uh, at Utah state where my wife is going to school. And she's like, Hey, do you need a job? My husband's looking for some help. Well, she come home and told me, and I was like, and I knew him a little, you know, a little bit, not like way well, but I ended up reaching out to him. And I was like, Hey, tell me more about this. Well, it was just an opportunity where I don't work for them. They don't own me nothing. They were just like, Hey, if you want to get licensed, go get your life and health license. Uh, we'll get you contract with these companies. If you want to sell them, you can, if you want to do Medicare and health insurance and all these other things, you can, but you own your own business. Like there's no pay. And so I just, I don't know why I just looked at it and I was like, man, I could start my own business right here. I don't have to have any employees, no, nothing like the overheads, nothing. I can just start jumping into it and doing it. Uh, funny part, both my mission presidents were also in the insurance industry. Uh, both of them, one of them created a massively successful company. The other one worked for a very successful company. So I was just kind of like, Oh, you know, they seem like they have cool lifestyles. So it was really funny when it came up for me to join and it was just an opportunity to start a business. And that's what I really wanted. I didn't want to go work for somebody else. I hate, I hate working for other people driving me crazy. And so I just did it. I jumped into it and not having no clue what to do, how to do it, where to do it. I was just like, cool, I can start my own business. And I love talking with people. I'll learn sales and there's no cap on how much money I can make. Cool. I'm in. So I just jumped in and there was no like, Oh, this is the career I want to build. I just built it as I went. And now I've just kind of like custom to where I, what I enjoy doing, where I find a big need and where I feel like I can really help people. And it's just grown. Like I've, I've never ran ads. I've never done not. I mean, it's just all networking and referrals. I've done a little bit of marketing and stuff, but I just, it's just grown for me. So it just happened. I think that's awesome. I think that more, there's, there's always room in that industry and there's more people in the world that need it than, than have somebody oh, yeah. that I know, like, and trust who, who offers good um, education, information, and then ultimately application. Yeah. And so <laughs> that's a, that's a fascinating um, thing as far as helping people do that. And I would, th this is for anybody, right? The question, the questions are what we're focusing on. What are the questions that drive who we become? And one of those questions is, Hey, I, I'm not happy where I'm at. Like ask yourself, are you happy? Are you content with where you're at? Or do you want more? That's a good question. If you're content where you're at, no matter how good of an opportunity comes across your way, it's never going to work for you because if you're content, it's not going to work. And so that's a good well, question. Are you content with where you're at? Yeah. And do you love to do it? You know, one, one thing, you know, Conor McGregor, the uh -huh. fighter guy, I just watched his little documentary on Netflix. And one thing that just rung true to me, I mean, every episode people would be like, dude, why are you still fighting? Like you've made millions. You could ride off into the sunset and never have to worry ever again financially. And he's like, I don't do it for the money. I do it because I love it. And like, he loved it. And that really struck me because, you know, the biggest thing that drove me towards the financial services industry is because 
the experiences I had growing up watching family struggle and stuff. And so I like at the end of the day, when I help people solve financial problems or whatever, you know, whatever the situation may be, like it fuels me. So that's one thing for people. Like, what is it that you love to do? Like, what is it that brings a lot of value to others, brings value to you? You hunger and thirst after you think about a lot. Like there's so much opportunity within that. Right. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I think, I think that sometimes people will hear what you just said though, um, as not what you said, right. They'll say, okay, well, if I don't love it, then I shouldn't do it. And, oh, yeah. and I don't, I always get, cause I hear that so much that people are like, well, aren't you supposed to love and be passionate about what you do? The answer I think is no. Okay. No, there's I like 70% it. of this business. I hate. Yeah. Exactly. Like when I got to, when I got, when I got to do it, I'm like, Oh my gosh. You yeah. know, <laughs> Where, where's the gun? Um, yeah. So like the answer is no. The question yep. is, are you passionate about becoming your best self? And do, are you in a vehicle that provides that? I don't think that Jeff Bezos loves everything about Amazon. I don't oh think God. that Warren Buffett loves everything about Berkshire Hathaway and everything he's done, but there's aspects that he does and he's willing to put up with the things that he doesn't do. And the other principle about, again, about life is uh, there, there's two principles here. One, the thing that you spend the most time with, you will ultimately love. Whether, like if you spend time in poverty, you're gonna love poverty and you try and go be wealthy and you're like, nope, this is not as fun as poverty. Subconsciously, not, not consciously, but that, that's one. The other one is crisis creates connection. And when crisis creates connection, that's part of the growth process. So if you're experiencing crisis in the, your personal development, you're gonna be more connected to that outcome and you'll grow to love something. I, I had this, uh, this experience, cause I served an LDS mission as well. And there were some girls that I really thought were really pretty before I left on my mission. Um, and then for two years, I still like thought they were pretty, but then when I got back, I was like, yeah, they're, they're all right looking. You know, it wasn't like they were drop dead gorgeous in my mind anymore because I hadn't had that constant relationship with them. And that led me to understand, look, I'm going to ultimately fall in love with my wife and looks are sort of important, but looks are going to change. And so it's not about looks. It's about, can I spend time with you and enjoy being around you? If I spend time and enjoy being around you, I will eventually love you and love every part of you. And that doesn't mean that I didn't like them to begin with and that some arranged marriage crap, but you know, I think that there's a lot you can learn from some of the Eastern cultures of arranged marriages. And it's that same concept when you're looking at starting a business, when you're looking at following your, uh, your dream or, or chasing financial independence or, or time independence, don't look for the thing that you're infatuated with that just you think is the end all be all. Look for the thing that's going to get you what you need and get your yeah. needs met and then fall in love with the process. Fall in love with that rather than yeah. trying to fall in love and then be willing to do the process. It's the wrong way to, to do it. Yeah. No, I mean, no matter what you do, like it's whether you love it or not, you will not love a hundred percent of it. I, I can't you think know. of anything. I No. And that's, you know, and there's another aspect to that, you know, like Warren Buffett and all these people, they hired people to do the things that they didn't like to do. They found somebody that liked to, to do that thing. And boom, you know, I just did that this last year. I hired an office lady. She loves, you know, she likes answering the phone and take care and stuff and putting stuff in. And I was like, bingo, do it. You know? And she, man, she takes off with it. Right. So there's a lot of aspects to all of those things to like really grow and build and be and have and do what it is that you want. Absolutely. Well, Hey, we're, we're up on, against the clock, but I'm curious if somebody did want to reach out to you, get to know you, get to know like what, what your services. I have no idea even all of your services, but that's not yeah. why I brought you on here. I brought you yeah. on who you are. Um, but where would they go and learn more about you and what you could potentially provide for them? So good place. Instagram. Uh, it's at real Jared Briggs. So J A R E D B R I G G S. So at real Jared Briggs, uh, Facebook, Jared Briggs, like you said, you can probably go over Sam stuff and find me a commenting or doing something on there. Uh, I've got a TikTok, Twitter, all those, it, all the handles are at real Jared Briggs. Um, I don't have a website or anything right now. I'm actually in the process of building all that, but best place, Instagram, Facebook, 
TikTok, Twitter, something like that. Cool. Yeah. Well, it's, it's worth reaching out and finding out uh, more about what he does. I mean, the, the fact is, I think if you can get attached to the right minds uh, who ask the right questions and then start asking those questions of yourself, that's where you're going to grow. And whether you end up exactly where he is or on your own journey, if you're asking the right questions, then you're going to end up successful. And yeah. that's what we're focusing here on the Fuel Your Legacy show now is what are the questions that we all need to be asking ourselves? What questions will drive happy, healthy, well-adjusted, productive humans in our society and strengthen our society as a whole? And that's why I'm so excited about the podcast as a whole and, and sharing this episode with you is I really want people to start asking themselves the right questions. Oh, yeah. Who's happy? Can I- can I add another plug right there? Absolutely. Just to I mean, go right along with what you said. You are the top five people you hang around. You know, the, the books you read, the podcasts and things you listen to, the people you hang around, like you will become that thing. You know, like what you think about and talk about and believe you can become, like that's what you will become. So it's so important to get around those people, learn from those people. I mean, that's been the biggest thing I've done the last two years is, you know, how do I get in the room of the people that I want to be like? And my life has exploded because of that. I mean, you know, I've even paid for a lot of those things and every time it pays dividends. So yep. such paying, a, such a good thing to do. Yeah. Probably the, the biggest investment that I've made in my business over oh. the years is paying for mentorship and it's always paid off. Best thing ever. Yep. Best hey, thing. Well, thank you so much. And we'll catch you guys next time on the Two Your Legacy Show. Thanks for joining us. If what you heard today resonates with you, please like, comment, and share on social media. Tag me. And if you do give me a shout out, I'll give you a shout out on the next episode. Thanks to all of those who've left a review. It helps spread the message of what it takes to build a legacy that lasts. And we'll catch you next time on Fuel Your Legacy. Legacy.